Okay, let's begin the public meeting. Let the record reflect that we can reconvene with all members present, except for the mayor, Robert Connolly, who has an excused absence. Please all rise for the to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, yesterday, as, as we all know, was September 11th, the 15th anniversary of one of the darkest days in the history of this country. Uh, I would feel like we should have a moment of silence for everyone who perished on that. Uh, we have the minutes for approval from the executive meeting of August 8th and the regular meeting of August 8th. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. Okay. No opposed. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mayor was kind enough to uh, send me some announcements that are interest everyone here and, and so if you bear with me I'll get through them as quickly as possible. Um, one is, uh, and I didn't know this until I started reading it, but uh, we're recognizing Catherine Zimmerman who's Madison's first professional athlete since Neil O'Donnell. Catherine was Madison High School class of 2012, Providence College class of 2016. She's a member of the Madison High School girls soccer team that won Madison's first state section championship in 26 years. She was named to all Big East first team during her junior and senior years at Providence, and she made her professional soccer debut with Sky Blue on July 2nd. Mm -hmm. so good for her. Nice to hear. Uh, a proclamation was presented at the 40th annual Pine Avenue Block Party. I assume you were there? I was. Okay. Was very nice. Good. Uh, the proclamation recognized several families who have been there for 40 parties and one resident who's lived on Pine for 60 years. This is obviously a very stable environment on Pine. Uh, th this could be the longest running block party in Madison. I think it's something we should check. And um, uh, Pat Rowe, who's traditionally been in charge of the group photo, right? You did it again? Yep. Good man. And Bob Landrigan, also in the neighborhood on Cedar, had planned to be there, but got called to an ambulance. Right. Thank you, anyway. Um, with regard to yesterday, I would also like to mention that we owe a special thanks to Thomas Daly, a Boy Scout who's in Troop 7. Last year, he had sent the mayor an email sharing his concern that Madison did not have proper recognition of 9-11. In the email, he had offered to have Troop 7 take the lead in this year's observance of the 15th anniversary of 9-11 uh, at the 9-11 memorial. The ceremony included sharing the history of the day, reading of the names of Madison residents lost, a moment for prayer and reflection followed by taps, and the lowering of the flag to half-staff. Madison Police Department then escorted the scouts to the James Park, Green Avenue, and Dodge Field flags, so that they could also be lowered. Thanks also to Chief Datchison and his officers for their assistance with this recognition. Certainly a nice move. Uh, reports from committees. I guess I have to I wear two hats tonight. Um, it's like blazing saddles, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the utility departments have asked me to read a statement a little on the long side, you'll also be getting copies with your bill, so bear with me. Uh, one of our meter readers has been unexpectedly out on sick leave for a protracted period of time. We wish him well and hope for a speedy recovery. In the meantime, the department is working overtime to read the meters. Don't be alarmed if you see a meter reader working up to 6.30 p.m. or on weekends. Every month, the staff 
goes property to property, reading close to 8,000 meters. That is nearly 50 meters an hour. This is just part of their responsibilities, as the readers also help with collections and final reads when people move out. Uh, it may be necessary to do an estimate when meter reading staff are due out uh, because of illness or vacation. The borough seeks to minimize estimating bills whenever possible, but it does unfortunately happen from time to time. The good news is that over the next year, the borough will be moving towards a more automated process of meter reading, first with handheld meters, and eventually going to a fully automated meter reading system. It will take some time to get used to the new technology, but the goal is to make the meter reading process more efficient and eventually eliminate estimated reads altogether. <coughs> the, um, I think I'll, given the amount of time I've taken with that statement and nothing really major from the, other, from the utilities, uh, I'll just move ahead to a report on um, health. Thank you. Councilman Cannell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Acting Mayor. All right. So, uh, okay. So the fall means flu shots. Uh, fall seasonal influenza clinics have been scheduled for Madison and are contracting municipalities. CDC recommendations are for influenza vaccinations for all six months of age and older. Additionally, all pregnant women, women who are planning to become pregnant, women postpartum, and women who are breastfeeding during the influenza season should be vaccinated. Madison Health Department will be offering mm, quadri quadrivalent, four-strain injectable vaccine at all of our 2016 clinics. <laughs> Residents may attend any of our scheduled clinics or may call the health department for a home visit if needed. No appointment or pre-registration is required. Uh, the vaccines will take place on Tuesday the 18th and Wednesday the 26th in Madison from 9 till 11 a.m. at the Civic Center and in other towns on uh, October 8th from 9 till 11 at St. Patrick's uh, Parish Center in Chatham Borough. On the 25th from 12.30 to 2 in Springfield. Uh, on the 26th from 1.30 to 3 at the Chatham Township Senior Center in Chatham Township and once again on November 1st in Springfield. Uh, testing for the Zika virus has been delegated to local health departments throughout New Jersey. Strict criteria, as per the New Jersey Department of Health, must be met before the testing process proceeds. Healthcare providers are required to work with local health departments where the patient resides to determine eligibility for testing. Factors such as travel to specific areas, presence of symptoms, pregnancy status, and timing of requests are relevant to travel dates. Uh, viral meningitis at Madison High School. Uh, a report of student who was being evaluated for possible viral meningitis created busy first day of school. Consultation with the Madison Board of Ed, Madison High School, Madison Health Department, and the New Jersey Department of Health led to the distribution to Madison District of informational communication about the illness from Superintendent Rossi's office. There are no general recommendation for treatment of contacts of viral meningitis. Concerned families were directed to contact their health care provider. That's it. Thank you very much. Finance and Borough Clerk, Councilman Ladner. Okay, thank you. I don't have my glasses with me, so just bear with me here. It's going to be a challenge. Uh, one and a half. Uh, let me give it a shot here. Thank you, sir. Okay, from the tax collector, the tax sale is scheduled for this Wednesday, September 14th at 10 a.m. in the tax collector's <coughs> office. The tax collector's department has done an excellent job following up with all property owners, and the utility billing department has done an excellent job following up with utility customers. As a result of their efforts, there are only two properties scheduled for the tax sale. This is the smallest number in recent memory. The tax sale is performed to enforce the collection of prior year delinquent property taxes and utility bills. On the day of the sale, the lien is sold via auction. Payment is due at the time of the sale, and as such, the borrower is able to clear up any outstanding bills from the prior year. A tax sale certificate is issued, and the property owner now works with the certificate hold to resolve the delinquency. Now, um, in regards to the 2016 budget summary, and I mention this because we're gearing up for the 2017 budget cycle. The CFO has completed a draft of the 2016 municipal budget summary. 
A large copy has been printed and can be found in Hartley Dodge. Once completed, the budget summary will be delivered to the Madison, to Madison residents via their utility bills. Now, a couple of, uh, just a reminder. Last year, only 22.5% of your property tax bill is controlled by the borough council. The school board is responsible for 62.3%, and the county freehold, freeholders are responsible for 15.2% of your tax bill. And I don't know if everybody has this, but it's all spelled out right here. <clears throat> of greater importance is the increase in property taxes over the last three years. I have always encouraged the council to keep property tax increases as low as possible, and I believe this borough government has done a good job with this. We are bucking the trend that is a cause of great concern, not only in Trenton and in the rest of the state, which is soaring property taxes. The table under the pie chart, and I'll show this again, shows the actual property tax bill for the home in Madison with an assessed value of about $667,000. As you can see, from 2013 to 2016, that property tax bill went up $807. $120 of that increase is from the county, 680 from the schools, and only 667, $6.67 from the borough, which is very impressive. I am proud that we've been able to keep our portion of property taxes in check. Those who have worked on the budget and those who have also supported the budget and voted for the budget should be proud as well. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Public safety, Councilwoman Vitale. Thank you. <clears throat> Report from the police department. During the month of September, a Morris County business owner donated two Colt handguns to the Madison Police Department, which once belonged to James Bellingham. Bellingham was one of the Madison's first marshals before the establishment of the police department prior to 1890. <coughs> one of the weapons has pearl handles and gold engraving, which was presented by Geraldine Dodge to, uh, to Bellingham upon his retirement. Bellingham was also the first trustee to the Hartley Dodge Memorial and believed to be one of the first chiefs of the Morris County Prosecutor's Office. The gun will be displayed in a police department once the secure, uh, once the secure display can be purchased. Uh, the Madison police have purchased a child ID equipment, which will be offered to parents at our first responders day in October. The cost of this equipment is fully funded by the forfeiture funds of, in the amount of $5,492. On Monday, August 29th, uh, the New Jersey State Association of Chief of Police conducted an on-site assessment of the Madison Police Department to include operations policies and procedures, facility and equipment. This assessment is the culmination of three years of preparation and we're pleased to, that we are being recommended for accreditation. The certificate presentation will take place after our final hearing at future uh, council meeting. Um, I, I want to extend my congratulations to uh, Chief um, Darren Datchison and um, Lieutenant Longo, who have worked for three years on this certification, and uh, it's going to be a, a, quite a source of honor for um, <coughs> Madison. Patrolman uh, Travis Daniel has successfully completed the Madison Field Police Field Training Program and will be commence uh, with solo patrol immediately. Corporal Della Valley will be assigned to uh, reassign <coughs> traffic. Safety unit, which has been unstaffed due to manpower issues. From the fire department, uh, during the month of August, the fire department responded to 25 general alarms, 23 still alarms, 31 investigations, 45 medical calls for a total of 124 calls. Volunteer firefighter Colin Scarpello completed and passed the firefighter one training course, the Mars Academy. Fire Academy in August. On a very hot Saturday, August 13th, members of the fire department trailered <coughs> Geraldine to Middletown, New York to participate in the 2016 National Convention and Muster sponsored by the Society for the Preservation and Appreciation of Antique Fire Apparatus in America. Geraldine was awarded two trophies, one of the best appearing Aaron's Fox, 
and one for the oldest motorized apparatus. Six Madison firefighters attended the 15th annual 911 ceremony held at the county 911 memorial site in Parsippany this past Sunday evening. And in that spirit, I also want to say that I attended, uh, yesterday I attended the, um, the ceremony by uh, Troop 7 at uh, 911 Memorial here in Madison, and they did a spectacular job. It was, um, it was a very, very nice day, and I'd like to see that continue, and uh, we pass that information on to the Boy Scouts. And please advise your residents that volunteer firefighters are neither. Yellow Flyer went out to the recent electric and water bills asking for help with information on how to become a Madison volunteer firefighter. Anyone interested in, in joining can go to www.madisonfiredepartment.com for more information. I, I just want to bring up something about Whippany River Watershed that uh, kind of gets lost, but um, it's an organization that we all uh, belong to. And uh, Bob Vogel and I got a very nice um, email from Whippany River Watershed Action Committee. Last year, we, uh, we got a group of uh, students from Drew University who came down and cleaned the tributary behind the Sunny Vitale Memorial Field. And um, they, they collected a lot of garbage off of that, you know, in Springbrook. And, and that, that was, you know, we used to have one family that did it on May Day and who soon lived, you know, I guess they're out of town now, right, Bob? And so it, it was getting kind of dirty, and that it's, um, it's an important tributary. So um, the students from Drew came down last year. Well, they contacted Whippany River again. And yesterday, uh, on September the 11th, they collected several bags of garbage and, um, and you know, really did a good job cleaning it up. Uh, I mean, they, they talked about old rusted shovels down there, hedge clippers, uh, uh, bottles, cans, broken teacups, and whatever. And so I want to say a special thank you to Whippany River Watershed to work with our um, with our Drew students and say thank you to our Drew students. So, if, if Jim, if you could get that message to them, I appreciate it. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Community Affairs, Councilwoman Bailey. Thank you. From the Senior Center, uh, September activities include stretch and flex, Tai Chi, healthy bones, ping pong, <coughs> pinochle, mahjong, bridge, pool, yoga, bowling, meditation. Knit and crochet, movies, balance and stability, poker, rummy cube, canasta, and songsters. Uh, we encourage our seniors in this town to participate. For more information on these programs, please call 973-593-3095 uh, or go to www.rosenet.org slash 347 slash senior-services. Also for uh, the seniors, Trans Options is a nonprofit transportation man management association. It is working to develop a transportation plan to connect residents to family and friends, work, recreation, appointments, and activities. On Tuesday, September 20th at 10 a.m., the Trans Options staff will be at the Senior Center to hold a discussion on transportation needs and priorities <coughs> in the county and in the town. The participants will be asked to complete a survey. We encourage seniors to attend this important meeting. And then finally, on Saturday, October 22nd, the Senior Center will have an open house. All seniors are encouraged to come and see for themselves what the Center has to offer. From the Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber has provided information on its website on a workshop for merchants um, on Store Design and Visual merchand Merchandising Keys to a Thriving Business. This is a program being given by the New Jersey Downtown Institute on October 19th from 9 a.m. to 4.15 in Plainfield, New Jersey. And the Chamber also <coughs> wants to remind all Madison residents that the Halloween Parade and Magic Show sponsored by the Chamber will be held Saturday, October 29th. The parade begins promptly at 12.30 p.m. at Hartley Dodge Memorial and uh, winds its way down to Waverly, where the magic show will take place at the corner of Waverly and Lincoln at approximately 1 p.m. From the DDC, 
The farmer's market continues on Thursdays through October from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Central Avenue. And uh, the DDC is also very excited to be co-sponsoring a downtown study focused on market and financial analysis, as well as reviewing, reviewing zoning, land use, parking, and branding. And I hope my fellow council members will support the hiring of Urbanomics tonight so we can get started. The DDC also appointed a subcommittee <coughs> Uh, during the summer to meet with Lieutenant Longo and Cindy Ware, our, meter, uh, our, our downtown uh, traffic uh, person, to discuss parking issues downtown, including increasing the number of handicapped spaces, reviewing the permitting process, and the regulations setting time restrictions on parking spots. The issues will be raised, uh, will be reviewed by the traffic di division, but then we hope to share <coughs> our research with and our thoughts with urbanomics because we believe these issues are an important element of our downtown. Regarding the downtown sidewalks, this council approved in the 2016 budget money to repair our sidewalks and work will begin shortly to make the repairs from Waverly Place to Dodge Field before Bottle Hill Day. Then Main Street repairs will take place after Bottle Hill Day. And Bottle Hill Day is an important day to remember in the town of Madison, is scheduled for Saturday, October 1st and it is Man Madison's annual street festival. So there's family entertainment and community celebration, which brings lots of people to Madison every fall. <coughs> we will have four stages with live entertainment all day, 200 vendor booths, amusement rides, great shopping, delicious food, and a beer garden. Additionally, we are excited to announce that the 2016 Morris and Essex Kennel Club Match Show and quote, my dog fun day, quote, will take place at Dodge Field on Bottle Hill Day. Also, as in years past, the Madison Chamber of Commerce and the Madison PBA number 92 will be hosting their popular annual Madison Car Show in conjunction with Bottle Hill Day. And Bottle Hill Day is free and open to the public. Vendor applications are still available. <coughs> then um, the mayor's All-Stars versus Quest softball softball game is next Wednesday, September 21st at 6 p.m. on Dodge Field. Please come out to cheer on the mayor, the borough employees, and volunteers as they take on the staff of Quest Diagnostics. The Drew Acapella Singing Group will be entertaining the crowds, and there will be games for the kids. Any child that shows up in their little league or softball <coughs> jersey will receive free ice cream on that day. And uh, the Recreation Department is in full swing with fall sports. And um, all fields are, there are 15 groups across 12 fields this fall. And we were able to rent additional time at Summerhill Park, Del Barton Park, and Lucy D. Men's softball field to some of our annual renters. And these fields typically go unused in the fall, but revenue, uh, rental revenue is now projected to exceed $40,000 by the end of the season. Um, neighboring towns, Chatham and Florent Park, do not rent their fields. The MRC is now fully booked for the fall season, and um, two residents have raised concerns about the expanded use of Niles Fields this summer and the corresponding parking situation, but it should return to a more normal level now that the ice, ice rink is back online. We were using um, Niles Fields when the rink was not in use. And um, the 5,000 um, AED grant from Investment Foundation will be up for discussion and approval um, at their September meeting. The ice rink field will be back online September for regular uh, recreation soccer, which is again over 600 kids in the program. And um, it looks like between rec and travel soccer, we have over 1,000 participants. And uh, Ski Red Club registration will open on September 30th at 4 p.m. The program will again be held at Mount Peter beginning in January. All forms are available on Rosenet. Madison Junior Football is running a pilot program that uses impact uh, tracking helmet sensors. And the field hockey field at Bailey Ellard is being reoriented due to the ongoing work uh, remediation. Cross Country will again participate in the Lakeland Junior Track and Field League, and they meet Sunday mornings at Greystone Park in Morris Plain. As always, information and registration for all programs can, can be accessed via the Youth Programs tab of the Recreation page on Rosenet. That's it.
<laughs> Is anybody <Isn't> awake? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for a very thorough report. You're welcome. <laughs> well, it's him. Our one Public Works and Engineering, Councilman Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not going to steal uh, Bob Vogel and Frank Russo's uh, thunder. They're here to do the 2016 road uh, reconstruction report, so I'll skip that item. I will note, however, that we're planning a, a community meeting uh, to discuss the reconstruction of uh, Central Ave next year, uh, and Bob will be sending out a notice shortly about when we have that scheduled, um, and we'll be invited to that. I expect it'll be before a council meeting. Uh, last year, we did about 6 o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Um, also note that the Prospect, Prospect Street Reconstruction Project has a pre-construction meeting scheduled for tomorrow with the contractors and affiliated utilities. Um, so I'll skip the rest of the road report. Moving to sewers, North Street Pump Station rebid. Opening is scheduled for a week from tomorrow. That is September 20th. And on the parks, uh, Voller's Construction has completed the final grading and reseeding at the Danforth Road Sports Field Site Remediation Project. Our New Jersey DEP and LSRP consultant uh, Mott McDonald have been monitoring all activities on site for compliance with state regulations. And uh, we received the Memorial Park Wetland Letter of Interpretation two weeks ago. Uh, the buffer plan now extends as much as 100 feet from the wetland areas. A uh, map has pr been produced in-house that shows the impacted uh, impacts to various municipal and pool facilities. Uh, some planned development activities will require permitting as a result of the state determination. And that's everything. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, before we proceed, I have one additional announcement, and, and that it concerns our employee of the month for September, who's Fran Boardman of Planning and Zoning, and it was, uh, she's been given that honor for her commitment and dedication in working to find alternative transportation for Madison residents in the event of a train strike. Uh, knowing Fran, we probably would have been better off if there had been a strike. That's, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> I just have also an announcement from the clerk's office. Okay. In anticipation of the November 8th general election, the borough clerk's office will be open late, open for late night voter registration until 8 p.m. on Tuesday, October 18th, last day to register before the election. Registration forms as well as the mail-in ballot applications are available in the clerk's office and online at marselections.org. And as a reminder, the electric utility rebate, rebate program ends on December 1st. Forms are available in the clerk's office and online. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll now ask the clerk to report on any community. <coughs> None received. Okay, so we now move along to the first of two invitations for discussion. That is limited to items on the agenda and any of the resolutions. Later in the meeting, you will have the opportunity to discuss any other subject, and there will be opportunity to comment on uh, ordinances during the hearing for each ordinance. If you uh, have a comment, please step forward to the podium, state your name and address and agenda item you're speaking about, and please also record your name and address on the uh, sheet of paper that's to be found on there, and uh, we ask that you keep your comments to three minutes. Anyone wishing to speak? Being none, I close that part of the meeting. And we now have several agenda items to discuss, first of which is the New Jersey Public Power Authority formation. I'll take that, Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, the New Jersey Public Power Authority formation. Um, the Public Power Authority is going to be a separate uh, local entity that the nine municipalities that own an electric utility in the state of New Jersey are seeking to create. 36 other states allow for the creation of an authority. The state legislature, thanks to our delegation of uh, uh, Cody, McKeon, and JC, were able to advance um, a bill, and the governor signed it, saying that the state of New Jersey can create, um, and these towns can create this type of authority. This type of authority will allow uh, South River, Park Ridge, Butler, Madison, Lavalette, Seaside Heights, Vineland, Pemberton, and Milltown to all work together, um, not only um, to lobby, which is what we have done in the past through a 501c3 Public Power Association of New Jersey, but also actually to, to purchase, to build generation, and to uh, work uh, collaboratively on procurement. So the creation of this authority um, has a number of steps. We've 
um, introduced an ordinance um, which will help affect this authority. The local finance board will be receiving an application for this. Uh, local finance board is a division of a group of the, from the division of local government services. And they're asking that the council pass a resolution, that's resolution 249, which is on the consent agenda, um, that uh, you are in support of uh, and approve the proposed establishment of this authority. Um, what we anticipate with the creation of this authority is actually savings because right now we have authority actions that we um, have and staff that work, um, I'm sorry, association actions that we have um, through the Public Power Association of New Jersey and that staff work on lobbying efforts, work with PJM which is the regional grid and, and alike. And we also have a separate company that we hire for procurement, American PowerNet. Um, we see that both of those activities will be able to fall um, uh, into um, an umbrella of sorts where the authority um, takes over procurement and Public Power Association um, works on continued lobbying and support um, and working with the PJM grid. So we uh, eventually see savings through this process by not having to have that contract with American PowerNet. So um, administration um, supports uh, advancing this resolution and asks council to consider it. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Okay, seeing none, then I'll move along to the downtown revitalization study and this happens to be me. So, um, <coughs> Jim, is there some way I can control that from here, or? I think so. Okay. Hopefully. This, by the way, is resolution 255. Something right under the keyboard, Jim, yeah, on this one? Uh, oh, uh, All right, I'll. If you don't mind, I'll. Okay. You'll be in his van of life. All right, what I'd like to speak to is a proposed study to assist in the revitalization of our downtown. Um, as you may recall, probably not, but you might, some nine months ago, this has had its own little gestation period, um, members of the DDC appeared before the council and discussed the possibility of such a study. The mayor, uh, hearing out the council's comments, felt that it would be appropriate for there to be a committee made up of representatives of various parts of our downtown business district and, and the town itself more broadly to re discuss this issue and determine how to proceed. Jim, if I can ask you to move it along, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. To give you a sense, oh, good, sense of the timeline, this committee met for the very first time on January 26th, and it took to May 4th before we were ready to distribute an RFP. We had some very spirited meetings. Uh, I think a lot of good opinions were shared, and, I, and we were told that our RFP was quite strong. And uh, I'm sure it was a result of those interactions. The deadline for proposals was June 1st. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, on the deadline, five firms responded, and uh, on the 15th of June, we invited those top firms, those top three firms of the five, to come to uh, Borough Hall and present. That was the way the RFP was written. It was determined early on that we, no matter how many applied and made the, uh, a cut, that we still wanted to keep it just the top three. We went about this in a very objective way. Uh, these various organizations were scored numerically by the participants in the room, and it was as objective as you could possibly be for something like this. Um, importantly and, and interestingly, on the August 13th, when it came to consider the various uh, firms in more detail, the, the committee had no problems whatsoever in selecting urbanomics. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about why that was the case, but first I'd just like to give you an idea of the representation of the committee, on the committee. So obviously there were three council members with Austri, Bob, and myself. We, uh, DDC was rep represented by Mike Kopas, and the um, Chamber of Commerce was represented by John Morris. I, I'll go through the others briefly. I mean, Melissa Griffey, uh, was there because some of you may know there was a Facebook page, there has been a Facebook page, that was initiated by uh, a fairly large number of concerned residents, 
and uh, Melissa was very much involved in this. It was truly a grassroots effort. Uh, Lisa Ellis was there because of her continued involvement with DDC and her previous uh, role as uh, the head of DDC. John Hoover has been involved in a number of committees touching on activities in downtown, and I'm sure you, if you've gone to our farmer's market, you'll know John. <laughs> Frank uh, is a businessman in town running the Madison Pharmacy. He also is an owner of real estate in downtown. Uh, John Morris I, is the president of the chamber. John Solu is a, um, uh, an owner of uh, property, again, commercial property in downtown. Russ Stern is involved in downtown activities for the town of Roxbury and uh, brought a professional's approach to what we were looking to do. Melanie runs two businesses in town um, and is a, a very concerned and outspoken member of DDC and was quite helpful in this effort. What we had to do as part of the exercise, and again, to keep it as objective as possible, was to present the weights that we would use in evaluating the various firms. The, the biggest weight, 40%, was given to the firm's background and its relevant project experience. Next in line, at 35%, was the team leadership, background, and the relevant project experience. And then finally, we looked at the cost of services. Uh, I put down the score that Urbanomics received at 12.1. The next highest score was quite a bit down the list at 9.2. And uh, the reason that I, Urbanomics um, was so easy to select on this list was because they were the ones that had the most experience with similar municipalities to our own, and they had addressed similar problems to the one that we're looking to get involved, more involved in, uh, in changing. They had a much broader range of experience among their team members. They, they really span the range from economists who understand business and retail activity to land use people who appreciate zoning ordinances and how to encourage proper use of uh, existing land to uh, a design firm that concerns itself with essentially the issue of branding. How do we as Madison differentiate ourselves. Without going into detail, I did put down the nature of the proposed deliverables. Urbanomics, unlike some of the others, um, had very specific actionable objectives that they wanted in, this, in the study. We had made quite clear to everyone that we were not interested in the study that we could check off on some list and put on a shelf. We wanted one that would be implementable. And they, they, as you can see from the, just some of the things that they proposed, uh, are very much in that camp. That's the remainder of their list. Um, so it's an extensive list. They will be reaching out to residents, stakeholders, et cetera, if indeed we go through with this. And um, it, it, my expectation at this moment is, uh, is quite high. I think the, the quality of what they do and what we've seen is excellent. It's a 60-day project, and that was specified in the RFP. And the cost of it, just as an FYI, is $57,000. Um, there are two additional surveys that we may or may not do. Uh, they're each at 5000 and they're both focused on parking. One is, uh, looks at the use of parking spaces, and, the, and how they're occupied, and the other one speaks to those who park in downtown and asks various questions about how they find parking, where they park, et cetera. So conceivably, we could go as high as $67,000. The DDC has offered to contribute 30% of the total, or in this case, if we do go to 67000 20100 and the borough is to make up the difference of 46900 are there any questions, comments? Okay, thank you. Next item is the 2016 Road Reconstruction Program Update, and I'd like to recognize Bob Vogel and Frank Russo to speak on this.
question. It's the right one. Good evening, everyone. Good to be back again, end of the summer. Um, we completed a lot of work on road projects over the summer. Uh, it was uh, quite a good spring for us in terms of the mill and overlay projects. Uh, with Silcon getting out of the box uh, relatively early and getting the mill and overlays uh, completed by about um, uh, May of this year. And uh, we also just completed with Cefeli and Sons the reconstruction projects uh, that were approved in the budget uh, last year. And um, what we have here is a little uh, uh, photo pictorial, uh, which you, you can see both existing and proposed conditions. Uh, I'll go through those relatively quickly, and then I'm going to back two steps behind and let Frank talk about <laughs> the uh, Prospect Street project, which remains to be done this fall, and a pavement uh, evaluation assessment, which was done this summer, which will lend itself to, towards our budgeting session and our five-year capital program and projections for roads for the next several years. So as far as the mill and overlays were concerned, again, it shows we did um, Parkside, Court, Hillcrest, Highview, Seven Oaks, uh, Union, and Sinclair. The MRC access was included with that project, and also the uh, parking lot for the library was included in that project as well. So you can see two of those projects here behind me. Quickly, as far as the road reconstruction projects were concerned, uh, they were budgeted as Kinney Street, West Street, Cross Street, Cottage Place, Luanica Terrace and Crescent Avenue. Uh, these projects were designed in-house. There was a bid opening on March 31st. And work started just after the uh, uh, Mill and Overlay projects stopped. Uh, May 9th, uh, uh, Revex uh, uh, company, which was a subcontract to Cefeli and Sons, started on the Waterline projects on May 9th. And um, as the uh, project progressed, the, the final striping was done just this past week uh, over Labor Day. As far as Kinney and West Street, you can see areas here behind me where the uh, pavement loss and uh, edge control was lost. Uh, particularly here, you can see a lack of curbing, you can see uh, soil erosion, and what that does is undermine the pavements and uh, uh, cause the road to be uh, destroyed uh, before its time. And so what we did as part of our project moving forward was uh, install curbing and drainage improvements through that intersection. and. Uh, really upgraded it uh, in the process. Uh, the entire neighborhood was subject to those same conditions. You, you can see in some of these pictures the uh, asphalt conditions are very poor. And so the uh, final mill and overland striping that was done there uh, upgraded that significantly. Uh, also at Kinney and West Street, we had a water main replaced. Uh, you can see water services on the left, which are brand new. Uh, the water main uh, in the middle picture, which is also brand new and some curbing that was installed uh, throughout the entire neighborhood, uh, which is also brand new. You're sequencing things on Kinney and West. You can see uh, a fair amount of reconstruction work that was done on the road, which is uh, uh, restoring the pavement base, uh, the sub-base, the stone uh, base that's underneath the road and then paving over the top of it. That's complete reconstruction since the road has degraded to the point of no return and needs additional work for the full pavement depth. Um, other pictures you can see in the middle there are um, a million overlay, uh, the milling project uh, we caught on the photograph in the middle, and the last uh, element of that is uh, tacking and milling the road and uh, funnel paving, which is shown here on the last slide. Uh, both roads, uh, three intersections were completed. Uh, signage and striping, again, uh, pretty much done just before Labor Day started and the schools uh, were open. So uh, good timing as far as our uh, road reconstruction projects were concerned. Cross Street, Cottage Place. Um, reconstruction was proposed on both roads there. Um, there was an old gas main, which you can see on the right-hand side of that photo. And uh, the pavement conditions have been destroyed as a result. Uh, no curbing also on the right-hand side, no curbing on the left-hand side, um, no edge control on the asphalt. Um, a fair amount of work is required to upgrade the Cross Street Cottage Place uh, area. There's some additional existing photos. You can see Main Street uh, Deli in the background. 
And um, you can see that utility trench again, and you can see uh, a shot of Cottage Street here in the middle. As construction progressed on Cottage and Cross, you can see uh, new drainage being installed on the upper left-hand slide. Uh, middle slide shows a brand new water main that was also installed uh, as part of the water main improvement program. And uh, on the right-hand side, I believe there's uh, several valves that were replaced and hydrants that were replaced uh, also, upgrading the entire infrastructure on the road uh, before it was final paved. And, uh, striped. So, also here uh, in this center photograph, you can see uh, some accessibility improvements that were made. The ADA accessible ramps are there. And uh, you can see the mill and overlay work that was done in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, final completed work um, on both streets, cottage in the upper left-hand corner, cross in the lower right-hand corner. Alonica Terrace, um, one of the bigger problems there was uh, drainage improvements. There had been a number of complaints uh, for the past two or three years in a row. We did a drainage project on uh, Madison Avenue. Um, several years ago, which we tied this particular Luanica Terrace drainage project into as well. Uh, this on the upper left-hand corner is a storm sewer improvement that was done at the very end of the cul-de-sac. Uh, and uh, you can see the drainage trench here in uh, shot number two. Shot number three is the curbing that follows it right behind. The entire street was uh, head curbing replaced with a much more attractive granite block curb. There was a lot of special driveways that were done uh, through some MISCO improvements uh, with the houses. There was five new houses on the street. A lot of them had very decorative pavers that were done and replaced and extended with Cefeli so that all blended together and looked very nice at the end. Uh, okay, so the lower right-hand corner, you can see uh, the final finished uh, paving and striping. Upper left-hand corner, you can see some reconstruction work just before the final paving was done on Luanica as well. Crescent Road, um, similar, issue, similar issues. Um, we had a uh, number of drainage uh, issues. Um, and uh, you could see the handicapped uh, accessibility, the uh, condition of the sidewalks, crosswalks, uh, very poor pavement conditions were quite bad. As you move through with existing conditions, you can see the sidewalk is well above the paved surface, and we really needed to put curbing in to make the sidewalk and the, uh, and the pavement and the uh, curbing work well together. Uh, lower right-hand corner, you can see drainage problems that occurred throughout Crescent Road with the uh, reconstruction work, the new uh, curbing, and a couple extra catch basins on that road. Those problems have disappeared. Uh, progress photos during construction here. You can see curbing going in. Sidewalk about to be replaced on both of those photographs. Uh, the entire length of the road on both sides was done with curbing. Uh, sidewalk was placed on one side. Um, here's a nice big color photo of uh, the uh, link uh, and uh, overlay vehicles uh, on the upper left-hand side. Upper right-hand side are the finished uh, road improvements. Uh, you can see the uh, new accessible sidewalks. And uh, signage and striping were done. Again, a uh, nice job in the end. Uh, so uh, 2016 overall uh, wrapped up with, um, so far to date, uh, 15 roads and one location such as the library being completed. Uh, so we're uh, really right on schedule for this time of year. Um, we have uh, one major project left, which is Prospect Street, which I'm going to back off and let Frank talk about once I... Advance the slide one more time, and Frank's going to also talk about a pavement condition survey that was done this summer. Greetings, all. <clears throat> Frank Russo, for those of you who don't know me, and Frank Russo, for those of you who do. Uh, Prospect Street, we're going to we have a pre-construction meeting tomorrow morning. We're going to set out, a, the contractors are going to set out their timeline. Most of the improvements are related to pedestrian safety. We're going to be bringing in the intersections to shorten pedestrian travel paths. Windhurst is really bad. It's about 100 feet from curb to curb. We're going to bring that into 30 feet. Uh, and really, all of the improvements are related to pedestrian safety. 
uh, and some traffic calming. We're going to add some bump outs on hillside and keep. We're on the top of the hill. We're on the bottom of the hill. Some minor drainage, some sidewalk replacement. <clears throat> we're going to follow it up with a uh, mill and overlay. There are the project's 75 calendar days. So the projected end at the latest will be November 28th. Uh, we intend on getting it done before that. It's going to be a mess. So it's not going to be quite as much of a mess as the 2016 program is because the improvements are a little more uh, tightly confined on the roads. This summer, uh, we, we wanted to initiate a, a pavement management program <clears throat> by rating, a subjective rating of every road in town. Right now, the borough, the average rating is a 91, which is really, really good. The last minute, yes. Hey Frank, could you go back to Prospect Street for a minute? Sure. When are you planning on doing this one? <clears throat> the pre-construction meeting is tomorrow where they get the notice to proceed. They have 75 days to complete it after tomorrow. Okay, because my only concern is you have all your emergency <clears throat> services down at the foot mm -hmm. of Prospect Street, and you're gonna, I guess you're going to give us advance notice because that's going to affect how the vehicles get out of both the public safety and the ambulance as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the sequence where we're going to start, we're going to go over tomorrow morning. Okay. Where was I? Oh, so M Madison has an an average rating from zero to one hundred. Zero being woods, one hundred being a brand new perfect road. We're at a ninety one, which is good. The last township that I did in Essex County, they were an eighty three, which isn't terrible. <clears throat> But I prepared some uh, light reading for everyone. Do with it as you will. I put pretty pictures in it. It's got colors. Try to keep your attention. Uh, we really, uh, in the last 15 years, the borough has spent a lot of time and money to upgrade the road system. And as a result, we really don't have any roads below an 80 or a B, um, which is really, really odd in the whole state. Uh, what, what we're, so over the past 20 years, there's been like a scripted road program. On this year, we're going to do these roads. On this year, we're going to do these roads. What we wanted to do was add a little flexibility and say, you know what? <clears throat> we want to kind of uh, account for Mr. Murphy and his law. You know, some roads just don't last. Some roads don't need to be touched. So what we wanted to do was attack the roads that needed attention now, spend money more wisely, um, and add a little more emphasis on maintaining the streets that we have in a very good condition. I mean, the numbers really speak for themselves. 60% of the road is, of, of the town, you get an A. 80% is a B plus or better. So that's kind of where we are. Um, the lowest roads that we rated, they are all planned to be addressed within the next five years in the draft milling overlay and road reconstruction programs. And in the interest of brevity, I'm done. If anyone has any questions. Ms. Rowe. Well, first I want to say thank you for making sure that all these projects got done on time this year. You were the guy out in the field pushing our contractors. Uh, Great job. The, the scabs and bruises should uh, fade soon. Second, thank you for taking on this uh, pavement management report because I think, as you said in the past, we've kind of done things on a rotational basis, but I think we need to make sure that we're focusing our energy on our most critical needs. And then one thing that just came up looking at this, I didn't really have a chance to talk to you in depth because I... We, we sat down Friday and we had the whole report in front of us, but I was just looking at this and one of my favorite roads is Chateau Derry. I mean, that road was not paved that long ago. <clears throat> the majority of the road is in good place, but it's a type of road that's coming apart at the middle. Do, do we have a way, similar to what the state does with the um, highways, where they're able to actually just dig up the chunk of the road that is coming apart and just fixing that section of it so we don't have to pave it 
curb the curb? Yes. Okay. We'll talk about it further then. There, there are a whole menu of payment management. It's a, it's a Chinese menu. You can pick. I went for the simple um, and time-tested. Okay. And that's, that's viable at a, like a municipal level? I mean, I know the state does it for miles and miles of big highways where it's very difficult to shut it down. But even at our level, is it something that's worthwhile doing? You know, I haven't been involved in any municipalities who have done like a seal coating on roads. It's, it's, this is more than seal coating. This is, you know, I don't know if you ever noticed, but on 287 or even I think 80, the state will take up a foot or two, um, pretty much where the line is that divides the lanes, because that's where they tend to sp split at seams mm -hmm. and just lay down new pavement. Uh, it is. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we could certainly explore, you know, just a, a limited milling okay. taking off. Um, I found overseeing the last couple of road projects is, you know, the base asphalt was actually in really good condition. Mm -hmm. But what came up, there wasn't a whole lot of tack coat. Not, not a lot of, have you ever painted a room? You got to prime the wall. If you don't prime the wall, the paint comes peeling off. Mm -hmm. So I think over some period of time in the past, no one primed any of the roads. So that's why they ride nice, but they look not nice. Well, again, thank you very much, and thank you to Mr. Vogel, wherever he's hiding. I agree that the pavement assessment's really going to help uh, uh, give us a more accurate uh, road reconstruction program, and, uh, and it also lends a lot to what our priorities ought to be for crack sealing, microsurfacing, and interme intermediate measures, which really haven't taken place in the past. They're hmm. going to be able to concentrate on that moving forward as a result of this pavement evaluation, which is town-wide, particularly on the local roads. And uh, it can't do anything but improve our uh, currently very good situation. Yeah, I guess one other thing I should note from our meeting on Friday, and that was the discussion we had with Ray, um, we've been moving ahead aggressively to try to stay way ahead of the curve in terms of being ready for the following year. You guys are pretty much set to go for 2017. Ray would actually like us to consider bidding uh, or, or approving the money this year and possibly bidding it out late this year, given the dearth of work that's out there because of the state transportation trust fund uh, bankruptcy. <laughs> um, there's a lot of hungry vendors out there, and we may be able to get some very good people to come into town to do our projects. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I, just, I also just wanted to thank my, uh, our summer interns and their young legs for uh, attacking every road in town. Thank you. Any, any other comments or questions? I, I just have a question. It seems like you're being very proactive in you know, looking at the conditions of the roads. Uh, as we all are painfully aware, Florent Park is planning a lot of work on Park Avenue, which will affect that whole section where Pat and I live. And the guess would be that a lot of the traffic will flow through our neighborhoods. Is that on your radar screen as far as the increased wear and tear in that neighborhood? Park Avenue is the county. I'm talking about the neighborhoods off of Park Avenue, Danforth, you know, Cedar, Rose, Beach, all those roads. They'll be used as a cut through. And what, what this payment management does is we're not on a set schedule beyond really four or five years. Mm -hmm. So what I anticipate is every three years or so we're going to go out and reevaluate just to see if a 90 today is a 90 in three years, right. or if it's a 60. Right. And what Pat brings up about Chateau Theory, I think is only going to be exacerbated by the construction that's going to come up Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'd now like to uh, turn to the Tri-County 55-plus survey results. Uh, recognize Lisa Gullin make the presentation. Good evening, everyone. So, um, first, I just wanted to mention that um, John Quitamel is here from Chatham Borough and Chatham Township, and John Hoover. They're both um, members of our Tri Town Coalition. Um, 
as you may remember, we had done, uh, we had spoken with you about a Grotto grant that we had received um, earlier this year to conduct a survey of our um, age-friendly communities in Madison and the Chathams. And so today I'm going to just briefly go over some of the results of the survey and some of our recommendations. Um, I think it's really exciting as a predecessor um, to this and uh, because there's a lot of activity coming out now and a lot of information coming out. Um, one article that I think I gave all of you as well, one of the um, pieces they mentioned in there that caught me was that you know, many thought leaders now believe that the communities that fare best in the 21st century will be those that tack both tackle the challenges and embrace the positive possibilities that an aging population creates. And Madison and the Chathams have always been such progressive communities. I think this ties in beautifully with what we are uh, doing. So uh, just, is this working, Jim? Or, uh, it's not, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, I got it, okay. So um, briefly, our project was um, through our, our competitive RFP, as I mentioned. Um, our main objectives were to conduct the needs assessment, um, to get us really to gain a better understanding of the characteristics, assets, and uh, future plans of the community residents aged 55 years and older in Madison and the Chathams. We had contracted with uh, Montclair State Center for Research and Evaluation on Education and Human Services to conduct the study for us. Um, and in retrospect, it was probably the best thing we ever did because it took hours upon hours. Um, and they really did a terrific and thorough job. Um, obviously, I'm doing a brief overview. I believe the entire council received the report as well as the um, full data analysis. So hopefully we're going to be able to share that with the DDC and other organizations that are looking for additional information. So um, the mission statement of, of Grata is focused on improving the quality of life of the older adults and their families, primarily living in Essex, Union, and Morris counties in New Jersey. Um, hopefully, I did update the PowerPoint a little bit this afternoon. Hopefully, you had the revised version. If not, it's going to get out to you electronically as well. Um, to date, Grata has funded, awarded more than $4.4 million in grants to more than 55 agencies across New Jersey. Um, the ones that have received the same grant as Tritown 55 Plus are Ridgewood, Montclair, South Orange, Maplewood as a coalition, Plainfield, Elizabeth, Garfield, Teaneck, Westwood, and Englewood. And the great part is we've been working with them. We meet probably every other month, I would say. We meet every other month with the grantees so that we can all now share the information we're learning and the different projects then, how we're processing the data and what we're doing and moving forward in our action plans. So the survey, um, was administered via on online as well as um, on paper to Madison, Chatham Borough, and Chatham Township residents. Um, it was comprised of approximately 60 questions that I would say it took us painstakingly about three months, two to three months to narrow down because everybody wanted so much information. Um, but we ended up focusing on community strengths, health care, transportation, walkability, housing, affordability, and volunteerism. This was how we determined our sample survey. Um, we went to our total population, we went to our estimated uh, 55 and over population, and we uh, looked for a plus or minus 5% um, goal. So our goal was 375. I believe we had 360 viable surveys among all three communities. Uh, just to give a little um, visual, of um, who participated. We had uh, 169 in, um, 149 in Madison, 92 in Chatham Borough, and 119 in Chatham Township. So some of the asset, assets that were identified were our libraries, our senior centers, um, the people, our town atmosphere, location, schools, 
the Madison Area YMCA, walkability, community programs, and our train and rail services. Uh, some, one of the quotes, and I have a couple that I've mentioned in here, which came directly from our focus groups, was I think it's a small town atmosphere, but yet it's in a big area where you have access to everything. Big city, beach, mountains, so I think maybe location in the small town feeling is an asset for the, of our community. Another one, I feel very safe and I like the small town feel to both Madison and Chatham because it's almost like we're one town, we're so close to each other and we have two police forces which makes you feel even safer. About the Madison YMCA, a lot of socialization and they get healthy and we have a lot of special need programs that are coming in. We have a Parkinson's program, we have a Live Strong for Cancer, Diabetes and for MS. We're starting a new program so you know it's a great place for people to come. Plus, one big asset is the railroad, or trains into the city. Train goes from Dover to New York City, so people who don't drive anymore have that aspect. So I thought that was some really great information from um, the various residents. Our needs, really, to us, were not a huge surprise. Um, first need expressed was housing. Um, the Tri-Town residents would like to stay in town, but are unable to find housing appropriate for their needs and budgets. Transportation, seniors who no longer drive may lose their sense of independence and be further isolated because current transportation options are limited in terms of times available, days available, and places accessible. Um, walkability, seniors are deterred from walking in Madison and Chatham Borough because of safety concerns such as speeding vehicles, traffic, unsafe crossings, uneven payment, and lack of sidewalks, which I do have some comments on that. Um, and the final one is the towns need a senior-friendly centralized source of information such as a telephone number, mail, radio, or local television station. One of the things that came out from the survey that we found incredibly interesting was, um, and you'll see from some of the quotes, was that some of the older seniors in the communities um, really aren't using the internet and that information. They really, um, you know, they want something delivered to them, something physical. Um, you'll note one, um, the bottom quote that I have posted here, we keep talking about going on the town's website. That's a passive way to communicate. We put things out in the local newspaper. That's got a terrible circulation right now. The other two are tap into and patch, and those are online, but they're passive, so we have, uh, I'm sorry, but they're passive, so we have to somehow continue to assess how we're communicating as opposed to making people come to you. It's difficult to use any service when the information on how and what is so poorly publicized. So this was one um, focus group statement, but again, like I said, the overall piece was they really want some more hard copy documentation. So one of the um, pieces that Tritown is considering looking at is how can we do dual information? Continue on the internet for our younger seniors that are very, um, internet savvy and move forward into the full electronics, but what can we do to keep them in the loop, the older seniors right now? Uh, a couple of pieces. Uh, I'm not sure I could afford to have the kind of housing I would like, i.e. a nice small house or townhouse that affords some privacy, but within walking distance of downtown and transportation to other areas of New Jersey. I think all ages would benefit from a downtown shuttle. It would be useful for our kids and cut down on parking congestion in town. So this senior was actually looking across all the age spans. Um, environmentally positive. I'm not interested in things that isolate older people from the community. Um, and the last statement, I like to walk for exercise and fresh air, but I'm concerned for my safety while I walk. People, and not just teens, drive too fast in neighborhoods. I would like to see articles in the local paper about good driving habits. I'd also like to see crosswalk rules enforced. So that was some of the, the more comments that stood out from us, and I believe those were the ones that are in the um, final report. So the Crees organization in Montclair, as independent evaluators, um, gave four recommendations. The first two are the ones that Tritown are gonna be looking to focus on. They're the most um, immediately sustainable. Yes? One question. So all these comments could be related to any one of the three communities? One of the three communities, yes. Right. So when you talk about walkability, Chatham Township's at one end of the spectrum. Correct. And, and Madison. Borough and Madison are kind of somewhere in the middle. Okay. Exactly. So some of the assets that we discussed and how they said they like to walk, um, Madison had um, obviously a much higher rating of walkability. And so some of the Chatham residents, that's again part of that shuttle, they would like to be able to get here to walk. 
Okay. So absolutely, yep. So um, for the recommendations, um, number one and number two are the ones that Tritown are looking at um, putting together an action plan for. Like I mentioned, those are the ones that are the most immediately sustainable, the most affordable um, with our small grant funding that we'll have. Um, so the first one is to, um, that each of the three towns should create a senior-friendly centralized source of information, such as a telephone number, regular mailing, or local radio or television. We did find that, again, a lot of the older seniors watch the television stations and listen to the radio versus going online. That could share news and resources as well as advertise community events. The second one um, was each town should consider expanding its senior bus or van schedule to accommodate a greater number of available hours per day and per week. Um, another option that we're going to be looking at at the coalition, I think I mentioned this as an example early in the uh, process, is that Uber has a grant program that they do work to make, um, to do age-friendly um, transportation. So uh, we're going to be probably looking into them a little more closely. Um, Ashri mentioned the uh, Trans Options Network. We're going to be talking with them to join the coalition to see what we can do with them as a group. The other two... Um, are, is great input for all three communities, but it's not something that Tritown at this point feels that we can um, address because it's a larger issue and it needs more long-term studying and information. So one was the three towns should create a, collectively create a position for a senior coordinator who could oversee the implementation of action steps emerging from this needs assessment. And Madison Chatham Borough should address safety concerns that deter seniors from walking to town, such as the speeding vehicles, the traffic, the unsafe crossings, uneven pavement, and lack of sidewalks. So that's where they were talking about um, some of the issues were in the downtown from Madison all the way through Chatham Borough. They don't feel that they can walk um, comfortably throughout that. And I know that's something that DDC is looking at is their walkability and if there's any issues there as well. So, um, like I said, these were based on the um, independent evaluators' recommendations, and we looked at it, and at this point, you know, the first two are what we can really handle, um, I think, in creating a, a first action plan. So our next steps is the uh, coalition will be using the information um, to create, you know, projects based on the low-hanging fruit that I mentioned um, to fulfill our mission of improving the quality of life. Um, possible additional funding from the Grata Fund for senior care and other foundations to assist. Um, there is the second um, grant, the second phase, which I had mentioned last year, of the grant, which is up to seven, which is up to seventy-five thousand um, dollars. I believe we had been approved for Part A. Um, we are working on finalizing some of that. The coalition also is looking at creating a communication hotline for the seniors in the three towns. Um, as well as how we can extend either those bus days or um, find other transportation options. And the final piece that was just added on is um, the Tritown Coalition has decided to apply for a 501c3 status, which we felt would make, um, make it easier for them to apply for a variety of grant funding. And then it takes the burden off all three communities um, because any matches would have to be uh, found through the coalition. Anything either of you would like to add? Any questions? No. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Four minute presentation. Appreciate it. Hmm. Is, uh, is there anyone else needing to be heard? Okay, seeing none, I close this part of the meeting. And we now move on to ordinances for hearing. The clerk, please read the statement for ordinances up for hearing. Ordinance is scheduled for hearing were introduced by title and passed on a first reading of the regular meeting of the council held on Monday, August 8, 2016. They were posted and filed according to law, and copies were made available to the general public requesting same. I uh, call up Ordinance 57 for second reading and ask the clerk to read said ordinance by title. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $54,000 from the Municipal Open Space Trust Fund for replacement of the Memorial Park Multipurpose Building. Hearing on this is now open. Anyone care to make comment? All right, hearing none, I close the hearing. <coughs> 
Okay, I move Ordinance 57 2016. I'll second. Discussion? Yes. Thank you. Um, did, when I went back over some notes from many years ago, um, in the past, I believe that someone offered to replace this building, and that's not the point. The point was, at the time, the borough attorney raised some DEP concerns uh, for this particular building. How, how, I mean, have, have, is that been factored into? We just got our LOI back, Bob. That space is outside the buffer area. Well, it's, uh, I can talk to that. There were some issues with the existing building because that had creosote in it, so it was removed. Right. Um, you know, remember the old Ogs and railroad ties, so that was an issue. Yeah. Um, the LOI came back, and we can build on cool. that same footprint, so that's what we're intending to do here. Fair so enough. No DEP issues. Thank you. Any other? Any other comments? Okay. Roll call. Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitali? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. <clears throat> uh, I declare Ordinance 57 2016 adopted and passed and ask the court to publish notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. Ordinance 58, 2016, Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $27,000 from the Municipal Open Space Trust Fund for automatic external defibrillators at athletic fields. Hearing is open for Ordinance 58-2016. Right. Hearing none, I close the part. Mayor, I move Ordinance 58-2016. A second. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitali? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. <clears throat> Declare this ordinance 58-2016 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice thereof in the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. We now come to the uh, time for uh, the second opportunity for discussion. In the meeting now to the public to ask questions, make comments on any subject. Uh, upon recognition, please state your name, your address, what exactly you were addressing, and please put your name and address on the sheet on the lectern. Anyone wishing to speak? Please. Uh, no sheet. Mark Trelanza, Greenwood Avenue. Oh, about to change that. Yes. <laughs> I'll sign in later. Yes. Yeah, please. Uh, there hasn't been any discussion yet today, but clearly, but clearly, uh, the electric uh, bill that came out um, this month, and uh, in the past, you know that I have raised concerns about the electric costs in Madison, and I would like to implore this council and. Uh, everyone here to uh, really consider an across-the-board rate cut for all of the residents in Madison, not just the rebate program for certain residents in Madison. Um, we uh, charge everyone here with that uh, important task, keeping costs in Madison low, and it is important uh, that this utility that is, is managed by Madison be considered in that and factored into that uh, approach. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, hearing none, I close this part of the meeting. And there are no new ordinances for introduction tonight, so we move on to the consent agenda. Uh, Clerk, please make this part of the consent agenda. The consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move resolutions R249-2016 through R268-2016. 270. Oh, I apologize, 270. That's okay. Second. Okay. Roll call vote. Any discussion? Discussion, I'm sorry. Any discussion? 
Okay. Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? I say yes to all, but I must abstain on R268-2016. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitali? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. <clears throat> Any unfinished business? Okay. Public safety, $56,435.94. Health and public assistance, $19,447.90. Public Works and Engineering, $297,430.36. Community Affairs, $8,249.12. Finance and Borough Clerk, $6,710,313.07. And Utilities, $1,167,958.34. The total is $8,259,834.73. Mayor, I move the vouchers. Second. <laughs> Roll call vote. Mr. Catalanello? I vote yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mrs. Vitali? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Wolkowitz? Yes. Mr. Rowe? Yes. Okay. Seeing no new business. Before I close, can I make one point of order? Earlier this evening, we did take an action that was technically in the public session, but it was without really anybody here. I think it would be fair to the public just to note that we're planning to have a discussion about the electric rates in October. And it will be uh, certainly reflected in the minutes, yes. It will be in the minutes, but nobody will the minutes. I, I'm sure. <laughs> Comment about that is that it has, the mayor has for some time been saying that we will address the subject of the electricity rates, and we would do that uh, toward the latter part of this year. And indeed, we anticipate doing just that. Uh, the, this is an issue that has been taken seriously by this council, reviewed annually, and will certainly be reviewed again. Uh, we, anticipate, we anticipate doing this uh, during one of our October meetings. Thank you. And with that, I move we close.